All right, you guys, this is my New Orleans story time. So I went to New Orleans for my birthday a few years ago. Um, my friends were supposed to fly in that day, but they ended up missing their flight. So I had a whole day to really just explore by myself. So I decided to do um, a few tours and I ended up meeting a great group of people, but we ended up doing the um, one of the graveyard tours. And of course, on this tour, they talk a lot about Marie Laveau. So if you don't know who Marie Laveau is, she was a voodoo practitioner, she was an herbalist, okay? She was big witch, okay? They actually did a season of American Horror Stories that was talking about Marie Laveau. So while we were on this tour, they were talking about how a lot of people like to leave her offerings, like bobby pins because she was a hairdresser and things like that. And I was like, oh, I don't have a bobby pin. But then I'm like, anyone that is crossed over, you can communicate with telepathically. So in my head, I'm just talking to Marie Laveau the whole time that we're on this tour and just kind of like showing gratitude to her, you know? And I kid you not, this was my first supernatural experience in New Orleans. Okay, so after that tour, I go back to my hotel room and I open my suitcase because I wanted to change my clothes. It was starting to get a little colder. I open my suitcase and there is a bobby pin sitting on top of all of my clothes. Obviously, I don't wear bobby pins. Okay, <laughs> I have no use for them whatsoever, but it was sitting so perfectly on top of all of my stuff in my suitcase. And so I definitely took that as a sign like, oh my gosh, she heard me, you know? And she's like, hey, I'm recognizing you. I heard you. Here's the proof to let you know that I heard you, girl, okay? And that's just one story. So stay tuned for part two when I tell you guys about the vampires that were in New Orleans, okay? Because yeah, I got a story. All right, you guys, this is my part two to my New Orleans trip, and we're gonna talk about the vampires that I saw. So fast forward a bit into my trip, both of my friends got there and we decided to go out and walk Bourbon Street and just see what the nightlife was like. We ended up at this bar that had live music and it was a pretty big space. I don't remember what it was called, I wish I did. But when you walk in, there's like the bar on the side and then this is what caught my eye at first. There was this table in the back right corner that a lot of people were sitting at and they were sitting like on top of the table and on the actual like benches of the table. Their vibe was completely different than everyone else's in the room. It was just kind of, the only way that I can describe it, it was like a still darkness. It was just kind of off. But there were these two guys in particular that caught my attention. One was um, this tall black guy, right? That was sitting on one of the table, very tall. And this other guy who was like a shorter white guy, you know, but they both looked very interesting. But I turned back towards the bar so that I can grab my drink and talk to my friend that was next to me. Tell me how as soon as I turned around with my drink, he was standing there right in front of me, like some twilight shit. <laughs> he started talking to my friend, asking where we're from, what we were doing. Now, one of my friend's boyfriends who actually lives in New Orleans was with us, by the way. But anyway, this vampire dude and his tall friend um, convinced my friends, not me, that we needed to go to this bar. I think it's one of the oldest bars that's in New Orleans. And they have this unlisted shot that you have to ask the bartender for that's not on the menu. And as we started walking, we noticed that we're getting further and further away from, you know, Touristville. And by this time, I really wish that I could explain it, but the vibes were just so weird. They were so weird. And I told my friends pretty much that it was a really creepy vibe. Like, why do we need to go all the way out somewhere else just for a shot, you know? And on top of that, their energy was just not normal. And my friend's boyfriend agreed with me. And I specifically remember like typing out a text on my phone. And as we were walking, I showed it to my friend's boyfriend. And I straight up said, I think they're vampires. And he just looked at me like with the most serious look like, I don't know why he didn't say anything out loud. Like, I guess maybe he didn't want to seem like the crazy one, but this is where shit started to get real. So there has to be a part three to this because there's no way I'm going to be able to fit it. So I'm going to post it right after this one. Part three, my New Orleans trip, vampires, let's go. We got to this bar that they wanted us to go to so bad. He ordered those special shots for everyone. 
myself and my friend's boyfriend just kind of looked at each other like, I'm not drinking this shit. I don't know what's in this. So like we barely sipped it and then just kind of like chucked the rest. And after that, um, the shorter guy, he started holding a conversation with one of my friends and this conversation was drawn out. Like I'm talking about 25, 30 minutes, but the conversation was only about her, like her life, what she's doing. Every time he tried, every time she tried to ask him something about his life, he deflected it or it was something like two words, like very brief, back to you. Meanwhile, his tall friend didn't say anything to anyone the entire time. He was just sitting there off to the corner, like just there, blank faced. And I noticed as their conversation kept going, the more drained my friend started to get. And then I was like, mm-hmm. A lot of times when people think about vampires, they think about blood sucking vampires, like freaking Twilight or, you know, whatever other TV show or movie. Most of the time, and I'm not saying that it doesn't exist because I know that it does, but most of the time, these are energy vampires and they literally suck the life out of you. And that's exactly what was happening to her. But they didn't want to hear me at that time. So after she started getting tired, all yawning and stuff, he tries to make his way over to me. And I had such a dominant energy when he came over to me because I'm like, you're not about to fuck with my energy. So I looked at him in the eyes the entire time. And every time he tried to ask me something, I reflected the question. I was like, what about you? And after about like five minutes, he knew that he wasn't gonna get anywhere with me. I like, can't play with me, I'm a witch. Fast forward, my friend started saying how she was tired. If we didn't do anything, she's just gonna go back and fall asleep. So when we left, um, they wanted to go to this four story like nightclub. But as we were walking there, I started telling them what I was feeling and what I knew that they were freaking vampires. And then we decided to lose them when we got in there. Now, when I tell you guys, this place was packed like wall to wall, every floor. I think we went all the way up to the third floor. I can 100% tell you that we lost them and that crowd of people because we were inside the building before they even got inside. So they wanted to go out on the balcony because they wanted to smoke or whatever. And I was sitting there telling them like, dude, like those guys were freaking vampires. That tiredness that you're feeling because they were draining your energy. Tell me how. Two minutes later, I turn around and guess who's there? And this time it was almost with a smirk on his face. Like, oh, that's cute. You thought you lost me, didn't you? And somehow he knew what I was talking about before he even got there. He was like, so what were you saying to your friends? And proceeded to pick me up on the balcony. Okay, this is the final part to my vampire story. So when he put me on that balcony, y'all, I was shook, like, and I look over to the corner where my friends were and none of them, none of them were like looking over. I was like, how are you guys not seeing this right now? So what I did was I kind of pushed my leg down so that I would have had at least most of my body like close to the floor. Like that was the smoothest threat I had ever seen. But I did get down. I was definitely trying to play it off and keep things cool. But either way, um, shortly after that, we ended up leaving. And it's so crazy because even after all of that, he gave me his number. <laughs> like, I kid you not. And in my head, I was like, hmm, should I have a vampire friend? My sheer curiosity and just like, wow, like this is magical as fuck. But then I kind of got over it, you know, curiosity killed the cat. I don't need to be friends with a freaking vampire and I deleted his number. But yes, you guys, so that happened. <laughs> There's a lady on TikTok talking about her encounter with vampires, so I'm as well talk about mine. This New Year's Eve, I was driving Lyft and I picked up an order and it ended up being at like a, a place that used to be a church, but it wasn't a church anymore, obviously, if you saw the festivities that was going on. There were like people with cloaks and like dark hair and heavy eyeliner and there was like a, lar a red glow from the building coming out. Four guys got into my car. As soon as they got into the car, I felt a chill. And yes, it was winter, but it was a different kind of chill. I turned around and looked at them and I immediately knew they were vampires. And it wasn't even just like a, a thought. It was more so annoying. Before they got into the car, I was thinking like maybe they were devil worshipers because I had seen like a goat head and like the typical symbols that you see with associated with that. But I was like, no, these are vampires. There were two brunettes and two blondes. 
they all had blue eyes not that that mean anything but their eyes were almost hypnotically blue they were so clear you could see through their like not their soul but i can't even describe it their skin was white but not white like crayon white but it was very pale but it was not a pale like you know some like white people are like oh i'm so pale even like red people with red hair how pale it was a diff it was still a different kind of pale because even regular people when they're pale there's still some warmness to their skin like their skin looked cold i don't know how to describe it but it was more so the feeling of me knowing immediately i start to panic my heart is racing I'm feeling like, is it too late to reject a call? Like, can I even ask them to leave the vehicle? And then I started thinking, okay, if I am panicking and my blood pressure is rising, then I'm like pushing more blood through my veins, which may mean that I may see more appetizing to them. This is all stuff that's going through my mind. The man behind me, the blind, who was like in the middle, touches my shoulder and immediately it's like somebody poured warm honey over me like that is the calm just spreading down my body it was like immediately i felt relaxed almost like i was in a trance kind of there but like watching myself i can't even really describe it and i knew at that moment that i wasn't necessarily in danger so then the guy is like well, our car is only a few blocks away, which I could tell from looking at the app. And he's like, but before we get there, we need you to answer a question. And you have to think very carefully about this. So now I'm like, okay, this answer is going to determine if I go home to my children or not. And it could just be my imagination and like me jumping the gun and he could have been joking, but it didn't feel jokey. So he's like, okay, well... We have two separate cars. How would you group us together? Who should ride with who? What? So I'm like, uh, I look back at them and they're smiling and they're kind of giggling. Now their teeth don't look like regular teeth, but they don't look like the typical vampire teeth either. But they definitely did not look like human teeth. Their canines were a little bit more pronounced, but not in a dramatic, fake way. I can't even freaking describe it. And actually, if I had to describe them to sketch them out right now, I couldn't even because it's like they're a memory, but not like a typical memory, like a memory behind a memory. I can't describe it. But anyways, I knew it. I'm like, you're vampires. Yes. I heard the answer in my head. No, I'm looking at them through the, cause I'm like, if they, if they lunge for jugular, I'm gonna crash us all. But I grouped the opposite hair colors together. And the guy said, well, why'd you do that? I said, I don't know. It just felt right. He said, excellent choice. He took out his phone and he's like, I'm going to start my car now. And I'm like, you can start your car from my car. And he's like, yeah, but we like you. You'll get home safe. Good. Like you'll get home safe tonight have a good night. And I was like, yeah, I was kind of thinking that, you know, doing lift on New Year's Eve could be dangerous because like, who knows what kind of, I was trying to make it seem like I didn't think they were the danger, but just let them know, like in case they heard me panicking, who oh, fucking went and saw the vampire. But anyways, they got out and they gave me my biggest tip of the night. You would think that would have been my last ride, last ride for the night, but no, I kept going. Um, I made it home. And I didn't tell any other person about this story because, like, are you supposed to share vampire stories? I don't know. However, I just did. So just know that there are other beings in this world besides us. And maybe they're not all so dangerous. So yesterday I posted a video about how I met four vampires New Year's Eve in Chicago. And I want to respond to a lot of comments I had because I described the scene when I pulled up to the location. 
which was a church that has obviously been revamped to be some kind of event space. And everyone's like, oh, you thought they were vampires because they were goth? Because I said that when I pulled up, like people had on dark cloaks and like makeup and like people had a goat head on a stick. And I saw people like carrying like the six point stars. And so I was like, I was like, damn, did I pull up on some devil worshipers or something? That's initially what I thought. That does not mean that the four men that got into my car looked like that. They were not dressed got that at all. They did not look like those people. In fact, they stuck out like a sore thumb. In fact, they weren't like standing there when I first pulled up. When I first pulled up, I checked the scene. And that's when I was like, damn, should I leave? Because <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. This look crazy. Um, But when they walked up and I saw them just in regular clothes looking like, oh, money, actually, I felt a sense of relief because I was like, oh, okay, these motherfuckers, like, they weren't even a part of this. So it wasn't until they got in the car and I felt the energy shift. And then I like, I didn't even really, when I felt the energy shift, I still just, you know, start like push the ride and went on the ride. But one of them sat next to me, three of them sat behind me. And that's kind of when I really started looking like, well, what the, like, I didn't know what that feeling was. Like the first initial feeling, it could have been like, are they schmurderers? Like, I don't, but then it was like a gut instinct that just like inside was like, these are vampires. And then the more, like now I'm studying and I'm looking at them because I'm freaking out. So <laughs> let me start off by saying, I'm from the north side of Chicago. I don't know if y'all know anything about the north side of Chicago, but we have Belmont. We have any kind of person you could possibly think of. So I'm very familiar with the goth community and what they look like and that whole aesthetic. In fact, the high school I went to had a goth community. The guys in my car were not goth. I Hello, TikTok. Fagger Freestyle here with another story time. About the time I met a vampire. I tried to do this story the other day on live and it just did not work out. But anyway, I just decided to record a video. People have been asking me about the story, so here it goes. I am a rideshare driver in New Orleans. So, of course, I encounter all types of people from all walks of life. This one particular ride was very interesting. Now, this was a couple of years ago when this occurred. And I'm going to tell you, for the most part, I remember what she said. I do not remember what she looked like. <laughs> Um, and there are some details that when the experience was over, like I had completely forgotten some things, but anyway, <clears throat> so I'm riding, pick up this passenger and I remember our conversation and the crazy thing, the craziest thing is I can remember her voice i can i can and even as i'm telling you this i can hear her voice in my head and i can even picture like this part of her face around her mouth her lips i i can see them moving as she's talking to me and i remember her hand being on my shoulder and I remember what it felt like when she touched me but a lot of other stuff it's like was just completely erased so I pick her up and I do know that we were having conversation I talked to many of my passengers 
and she is telling me I have really great energy. So I told her, thank you. You know, she asked me some things about myself, you know, nothing too private, nothing with too many details. So, you know, I just kind of gave her some general info. And I remember her telling me that she wasn't from here, that, that I do remember. And then she proceeds to tell me how much she loved New Orleans, how much she loved being there, living there etc cetera, etc cetera. I do recall asking her where she was from originally and all she told me was that she was from very far away and it's, it's funny again because I like I'm hearing her voice in my head as if this is weird um and I've never shared this story with anybody so TikTok you're getting it first. <laughs> um, she touched my shoulder at one point. And this is where things got really strange. She touched my shoulder. And I felt like I just froze. And even as I'm talking to you right now, I can distinctly remember that feeling of feeling frozen. And my hands were on the wheel because I, I, I could see the hand, my hands on the wheel. The car wasn't moving. And being frozen in that moment, I hear her voice, but not like I'm here talking to you in my head. I hear her voice telling me, don't be scared, that she's not going to harm me. And then after that, we're moving again. And I remember kind of turning and looking like that. And she was sitting back in the seat and her hands were on her lap. And I said, what, what did you do to me? And she just smiled. And she says, I just leached some of your energy. And I said, what? She said, I just leached some of your energy. She said, this is going to sound crazy. But I can assure you it's true. I'm a vampire. She said, but I'm not the type of vampire that you've been taught about in books and movies. She said, those types of vampires exist but they're very rare these days. I'm a vampire that feeds off of energy. And all I have to do is touch you to get it. She said New Orleans is a great place for her and her kind to exist. And that there are quite a few members of their tribe is what she called them. I think I remember this part of our conversation so significantly because I I believe when she touched me, she implanted something in my mind, whether you want to call it a memory or a thought or an idea. But she she gave me something of herself probably to where I can recall this portion of the interaction between us. Maybe she knew that eventually I would share the story with others and therefore maybe make it 
a little bit more acceptable for them to start, you know, for her and her members to start presenting themselves. I don't know. I don't know why she she even chose me for this. But she told me that there are vampires that survive off of good energy. There are vampires that survive off of bad energy. There are vampires that survive off of sexual energy. And there are vampires that survive off of blood. And New Orleans is the only place in the world where you can find members of all four of those vampire tribes. Maybe she wanted me to remember this portion of it as a warning. I don't know. <laughs> but I know she wasn't lying just because of how I felt and and, and even now it's crazy because I I still feel like her hand is on my shoulder which makes me wonder when she touched me did she create some type of psychic connection between the two of us I don't know but I think I'm gonna I need to end this anyway um I don't remember where I dropped her off at I don't even remember dropping her off The next thing I remember doing clearly was being in a part of town that I didn't remember how I even got there. And it was like two hours later. And I was just in a parking lot. (laughs) Just in a parking lot. And... I know it sounds weird, y'all. Um, I think I'm going to, I probably shouldn't even recorded this. I probably shouldn't even be talking. I probably should not even be talking about this. I, I shouldn't. Okay, so I've been seeing a bunch of people get on here and sharing their experiences with vampires, um, particularly in New Orleans. So I thought I would come on here and share uh, my experience. So I grew up in Louisiana, Um, born and raised. I'm from a small bayou town called uh, Pierre Part, Louisiana. Um, My cousin is Troy Landry on Swamp People, if that gives you like a little bit of a idea of where I'm from. Uh, if you've seen the show. Folklore was definitely something that we grew up with, that we knew about, um, like vampires and um, uh, the Rougarou, which uh, is our version of a werewolf. We've all had experiences, especially as teens, um, with things like that. Uh, I will not tell their stories. That is for them to tell, and they would tell it better than me as it would just be like a recounting of what, you know, they've told me and other people have, you know, um, corroborated or um, confirmed or backed it up. Um, So I'm not gonna tell those stories, but I will tell my story of when I was living in New Orleans. So back in 2016, I had just graduated high school and I really wanted to move to Los Angeles. Um, I live here now, but I couldn't do that at first. So I moved to the next best metropolitan city that was in my home state, which was, sorry, my nose is just, uh, New Orleans. And uh, I lived there for a year. It was definitely an experience. I've seen things I felt things I did things I um I dated a voodoo priest for a little bit who um did a ritual on me consensually uh watched him get possessed still don't know what to make of that story um that's a story for another time 
though. Um, just telling you, you know, like New Orleans and Louisiana in general is a very new, super, very supernatural place. Um, in 2016, around Halloween, uh, there was a festival going on called uh, Voodoo Fest, um, which is kind of like Coachella, but in New Orleans. Um, a bunch of my friends from my hometown were in town, and a few of them were staying at my dorm, a few of them were staying at my other friend's dorm. Um, and one night, we all decided that we were going to get dressed up and go out to the French Quarter. Um, because there was a block party happening and New Orleans is like really great for Halloween. So we were all just going to go out and like have fun, um, and have a good time. I don't remember why we stopped at this particular part of the French Quarter. Um, I, you know, knew the French Quarter like the back of my hand, but this particular part, I can't remember if there was a bar right there or... Uh, if there, if like my friends were going in for a bar and, we, and a few of us were just waiting outside, um, it was, it, I, I don't remember, but I remember sitting on the sidewalk and one of my friends was sitting right next to me, but she was on her phone, um, or talking to it or talking to one of our other friends. For context, I am Claire Sentient. I am an empath. I can sense energies. I've always been able to feel them. Uh, people's vibes, whether or not they like me, you know, um, energies whenever I enter a room, whether someone's lying, stuff like that. I felt something that made me look up. It was a very wild presence, very alarming. Um, it made my uh, my hairs on the back of my neck stand up immediately and so I looked up and immediately I see these two beautiful men and I'm not just talking like beautiful men like these were the most perfect specimens of human form that I had, I had ever seen their faces were flawless were like they were they were they were not very pale, but they were pale at the same time if that makes sense. Their skin was almost translucent, but they were they were very they were very glowy. Um and they were both the same height. They were both they, I don't think that they were dressed up. I think I can't remember if they were wearing suits or if they I remember they were wearing black, but I I can't remember if they were wearing suits or if they were wearing like a leather jacket. I remember they were like just like kind of casual. Um One had long blonde hair, one had long brunette hair. They both had striking eyes. Like, not red, not golden. They had striking blue eyes, both of them. They both looked at me at the same time. They noticed me noticing them. And it was, it, it, it sent this shiver down my spine and this bell that rang, no. And immediately the word vampire went through my head. They locked eyes with me as they were walking. They, were, they kept walking, they did not stop. But they, let, they, they, they locked eyes with me as they were walking, just like this. And I was kind of like, you know, just like immediately was like, I need to shift my attention. So what I did was I averted my gaze to my friend next to me, and I was just like talking to her. Um, you know, uh, I brought something up and I was feeling like I need to not look back at these men until I felt that they've gone away. And I did that. And then when I felt that they were gone, I looked and they were gone. And I kept it to myself. I had a feeling like, do not talk about it right now. Bring it up later if you want to talk about it. Um, it was definitely weird. Jarring is a good word. And so later that night, when we get back to my dorm, I tell my friend about it. And I was like, this happened to me. 
I, I swear I saw two vampires tonight. And she's like, you mean those guys that were like staring at you? I was like, yeah, you saw that? She was like, yeah, the vibe was off. She was like, it didn't, that didn't feel right. And she's like, they were the most perfect people I've ever seen. And I'm like, I thought the same thing. And so we just kind of chalked it up to that. It was a, um, a, I think that they were vampires. I'm not entirely sure what exactly they are, but I'm pretty sure that they were, they were vampires. That's just my take on it. That is my experience. Uh, do with it what you will. Um, of course, you know, you could take it at face value. I don't really care. Um, that's just my story. I'm seeing all these videos about vampires popping up on my TikTok for you page. And I never, ever thought I would tell this story, at least in a public forum. But here goes. This is my vampire story. It still baffles my mind when I think that, say that, and I still get the creeps with the memory of any of this. And I'm going to be a little bit cryptic if you get my drift with regards to some of the experiences. But several, several, several decades ago, I had lost my job. I had just had my baby girl. So she's going to be 30 this year. So that's how long it's been. And I had gotten a job interview at a local business. Again, I'm not going to say what kind of business. And I went to this interview and I immediately felt something odd with the owner of this business. There was something so mesmerizing about him. He wasn't good looking, but he was good looking. It's hard to explain. Like there was just something strange about him and he just felt almost hypnotic. And he said, I'm interviewing for a couple more people and I'll give you a call in a couple days and let you know if you get the job. Okay. I did get the job. A couple days later, he gave me a phone call and he said, I am offering you this job at this pay. And it wasn't bad. The hours weren't bad. The pay wasn't bad. And I said, let me think about it. I had another offer on the table and he said, you know, please let me know by tomorrow. And I'm like, understood. So I had called my mom and my mom was very intuitive, even though she didn't really want to admit that she was. And I told her and I'm like, I, I got this job offer. And I didn't even tell her a lot of like the creepiness that this guy kind of gave me. And she's like, Christy, I have a really bad feeling. Do not accept this job. Do not accept the job. I'm telling you right now, something's not right. Do not accept this job. Now, this is a business that was in the the person's family for a long time. And so it wasn't anything out of, um, you know, it, it wasn't like a starter company. This person was kind of known in the community. My mom didn't know him. But so it was a substantial, you know, real job. And I'm like, mom, I, I don't understand. I need a job. She's like, you're going to get a job offer from that other place that you interviewed for. Just stick it out. Tell this guy no and accept the other job once it comes. And I'm like, I, this job was actually, it was pretty good. But I took my mom's advice and I called the gentleman the next day and I said, I'm so sorry. I am really honored, but I'm declining the job offer and... Um, thank you very much for your time. And he's like, I will double your pay. I excuse me, sir. I will double your pay. Now it already was good pay, but double the pay was a lot of pay. And I'm like, again, something felt really off. And I'm like, sir, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm going to decline. And he's like, I'm going to check with you in a couple days. And there was just something very ominous about the way that he said that. And that night, I ended up having a dream with him in it. And it was very vampire-ish is the only way that I can describe it. And the business that he was in also spoke volumes for that. So a couple days later, he called me 
And I said, again, sir, I've accepted another job and I did not tell him with whom. And he was, he's like, I will triple your salary. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. And he said, I can tell that you are very psychic and I can tell that you know who I am and what I am. And I think it would behoove you to take this job. What? So I told him again, no, thank you. And he said, okay. Now this was like, internet wasn't really a thing. Like you couldn't really look people up. There was AOL chat and such like that, but you couldn't really look people up like you can now. And so I ended up accepting a job at a, um, a cabinet store and um, as an office manager. And I didn't hear from him, but I was still having these weird nightmares with him in it. And I'm like, it's just got to be in my head, right? But it was almost like he could read my mind. It, it was very strange. Well, guess who showed up at the kitchen store the second day that I started? Yeah, this guy. And, and it's like he knew that I was going to be there. He's like, hi, Christy. And I'm like, excuse me, what are you, are you stalking me? Like, what are you doing here? And he's like, I'm ordering a new kitchen for the business. Like, it was nothing. And he continued to come in my dreams. About a year later, I ended up taking a job at a fireplace store as an office manager. A couple days into that, this gentleman walks in and says, I need a new fireplace for my business. Excuse me. Now, I'm not going to say everything about the business and everything about him, but you might be able to figure it out with a clue. And that is he lived above the business. That's all I'm going to say. So he's like, yep, I need a fireplace. And, and I'm like, sir, I don't understand why you're here. And he continued every time he's like, would you like to work with me? I'm like, nope, I'm good. I'm good. I worked at the fireplace store for a couple of years and he would every once in a while call and he would ask for the fireplace to be serviced. And I ended up telling my boss at the time, like how I felt about him. And he would laugh and he's like, I'm going to send you out there with the tech. And I'm like, no, you're not. But he was like, yeah, something strange about this person. Something is almost like immortal even if you look at the family lineage it's like he's existed before and it wasn't like his great great grandfather it was like him so I ended up quitting a couple of years after that and I worked for a school district and guess who showed up at the admin office him and in the meantime he's still coming in my dreams and every once in a while he's still calling me and asking me if I want a job. And um, no. My mom had passed away. I'd gotten a divorce. I mean, we are, we are eons into this. And I ended up um, running into him at a store. And he, you know, like, do you remember everybody you interviewed like one time? Because he either has a really crazy memory or it wasn't like a stalker. He just he just wasn't. That wasn't the case. It it's just again, it was very vampiristic. Is that a word? And so he I ran into him, um, and he's like, Hi Christy. And again, he's like, How are you doing? And it was just very kind of Norman Bates creepy. I Ended up um, in, in the job that I'm in now. I'm a professional psychic medium. I ended up having to go to a competitor of his to work on a case. And I, we ended up talking about this gentleman and his business. And I didn't say anything. But the owner of this establishment went... Um, just Christy, make sure you stay away from, because he's a vampire. And I didn't laugh. And she didn't laugh. And she knew I knew. And I knew she knew, too. 
So vampires do exist and they don't necessarily wear capes. Sometimes they wear business suits and sometimes they invade your dreams. And I feel as if there's a possibility that my life at that time was a little bit um, crazy and it was because of the psychic sort of like vampire energy that he was sending to me because he was mad that I did not accept a job with him. I would love to tell you more, but I don't want to open up that can of bats. A few weeks ago, I told you about my literal interview with a vampire a long time ago. And I was talking to a friend about this and she's like, you really need to explain more because there might be more context to this that really honestly does sound like it's a book talk. Um, so, and I can't validate this, but here goes. Um, when I was eight years old, I had gone to a local mall with my parents. My grandfather had just passed away and my father thought that in order to help her heal, he would hand over a credit card and let her go to town at her favorite store, which was Winkleman's here in Michigan. And so we went to the mall and they left me in front of the store with a book and I was a good kid. So they're like, we will be back after, you know, mom has shopped her heart out and her grief out. And so I started reading my book and before I knew it, this man came up to me and he had a camera around his neck and he asked if he could take a photograph of me. I had long blonde hair at the time and he kept talking about how much he loved my blonde hair. And so I said, yes, I'm an idiot. I'm eight years old. And he took a photo of me and he told me that the photo wasn't quite right, that I, the lighting wasn't right, that I needed to stand up. Now, he also said he had a couple of photographs that he had to take because he was going to go get his film developed. Those of you that are young, we used to actually have to wait days to get our film developed and we would have to like use all of our film or we would have to you know, take pictures of nothing and say that we didn't want to pay for those pictures. It was a whole thing. So that was his excuse for, I have a couple pictures left. I'm going to the mall down there. I'm going to go get my film developed. Can I take your photo? So I stood up and before I knew it, he had grabbed my arm and he was dragging me towards the exit of the mall. And my grandfather had just passed away. My grandfather was like my person. He was this amazing human being. And as I got to the exit of just before he was gonna leave with me, I felt my grandfather's spirit around me and I heard him say, run. Now that might, not see a, might seem like a no brainer, but in the moment it was, you know, I was just, I, again, I was eight years old. So I felt a physical push away from me and I felt the energy of my grandfather around me and I ran and I got my parents and we made a police report. And this was in the 1970s and here in Michigan, there was a serial killer called the Oakland County Killer. And he is still, it's still an unsolved case. Was it this person? Was it the Oakland County Killer? I'll never know. It was obviously someone really bad that didn't have good intentions. A couple years after that, I had another attempted kidnapping from my school, for me. And when I described the man, it was the same man. It was, it was the same man. So when I was telling my mom about this interview, sorry, we have a really bad mosquito problem. When I was telling my mom about this interview and I was describing to her the person, she's like, Christy, this sounds like your kidnapper. And she's like, I am unsure if you have a, she called it an elemental. And again, at that time, I didn't quite understand. But she's like, now we also come from a very Scottish Irish family. And my mom was very superstitious. 
she didn't want to talk about the supernatural, but she was very, very superstitious. And coming from a Scottish Irish family, we learned of fairies and, you know, things that they say don't exist in this world. We weren't necessarily told to believe in it, but we were taught it. And so she's like, I'm kind of feeling like maybe there's this full circle moment and this is him. So for those of you that said, why didn't you take the position? And why did you listen to your mom? You were an adult, you didn't have to listen to her. Did he look like my kidnapper? I'm still not for sure that my mom was correct with that. I, however, do believe that there was and maybe still is like a ring, not necessarily a ring of vampires, but a ring of really bad people, even at that time, that were committing really bad acts. And I think that that's what she thought that maybe he was in. He, she just felt like it was just too weird. And especially when he started like trailing me through almost 10 years of my life afterwards, it was just odd to her. And I, um, after my attempted kidnapping, I ended up cutting my hair. I didn't have long hair after that didn't realize that there was trauma with regards to that until much later. And when I got divorced from my kid's dad, um, I dyed my hair red. I was a strawberry blonde. I always, I have the redhead gene. So obviously not my natural hair color, but I think that there might be, I don't know, was he going after blondes? I was a blonde then, not now. And I haven't seen him since I've become a redhead, so. Coincidental? I don't know. So I wanted to explain, add a little bit more mystery to the story, but yeah. So my weird life. Well, that's just a little bit of my weird life, but my weird life. I hope that that answers one of the questions that a lot of you guys had with regards to why did you listen to your mom? And I guess maybe it said in my mind that maybe she was right and maybe... I needed to listen to her. I didn't listen to her a lot, but I listened to her with regards to that. So that's my story. This is my vampire story part two. If you haven't seen the first one, go back to it. It's a little long and I tried to shorten it and I guess I'm not really good at uh, doing that. So I apologize. I was off of socials for a couple days and I came back to all these comments and questions and you guys are so cute. I love all of you, even the ones that think that I'm weird because honestly, I think I'm weird too. And this whole experience was really weird. It really was. I got a lot of private messages asking me if I could tell them who this person was or what the business was and absolutely not. I think it kind of gives power to it and I'm even tiptoeing in some energy that I probably shouldn't be in, you know, doing this story and even trying to be as vague as I can be. And only a handful of people know who this person is and I've kept it. So, um, the other thing was I got a lot of, oh my gosh, did you think he was going to kill you? And it's done in a very sarcastic, you know, t tone. And I absolutely, I don't know what his end game was. It would be something that only he could answer, but no, I never felt like he was trying to take my blood or take my life or anything like that. I do wonder if there was a a psychic energy that we shared, maybe a past life, because as much as he wasn't like good looking, he was hypnotic and he was just... I, I can't explain it. There was just something about him familiar. There was something about him that made me feel some kind of way, but not in a romantic way. And it was, it was just, um, there was like a soul attachment maybe. So maybe he wanted some of the, the psychic energy. I've always been a psychic medium. I've always seen dead people and I don't, 
didn't at that time disclose it to like anybody, but my family knew my, my spouse at the time knew, but I knew that he knew that, that I was, and he sensed that and, and maybe he was as well. And he wanted to train me, you know, I, again, I'm not, I'm not sure. So I, I don't think that, you know, he meant anything ill with the interaction and obviously he was very persistent for several years to make it known that he was a presence around me. Um, has he come in my dreams or has he tried to find me in real life recently? No, it's probably been probably about 10 years now. Now, so it was about 20 years, 15 to 20 years of him popping up in my real life. So that's a lot. Um, but it was never done in a stalker way. It just wasn't. Uh, I was asked if he aged. No. And the interesting thing is I have seen photographs of his family, the business that he owns, his family owned. And there's either a grandfather or a great grandfather that looks exactly like him. Almost as if they took his photograph and put it there. And yes, we can look very much like our relatives. I get that. But it's suspicious. Um, and the other thing is I also had people in the same business that are very normal who kind of validated, you know, exactly what was going on with it. Vampires aren't, the vampires are misunderstood. Let, let's say that. I used to have a podcast way back when, before podcasts were a thing. It actually wasn't cool back when I had a podcast. And I had interviewed people who were in the vampire community, specifically in Columbus, Ohio. And they gave, you know, more information about what vampires were. And they're more of an energy than like take your blood. Now there are some that that's what they do, but there's more that learn how to use and abuse energy and to sort of suck that energy. So I had, at the time I had just had a child and maybe that was enticing to him because I had that child and, and honestly, maybe Maybe there is something ill about that, that and he knew I had just had a child. So again, I'm not sure what his end game was. Um, what blood type am I? A positive. Yeah. And what were some of the other questions I'm trying to remember? Um, I have never used his business. I will never use his business. I my close, you know, even my kids who are older now, you know, I have told them don't use their business. Don't ever use their business for me. Uh, just because of my interaction. Do I regret not taking that job? A little, maybe a little. My curiosity, you know, peaks every once in a while. My mom, who, like I said, was very intuitive. My mom was actually blind, but my mom was super intuitive. And when I tiptoed in the waters of possibly accepting that job because he had offered me a lot of money, um, she was she flat out told me she would never talk to me if I took that job. Now, the other thing is my the job was administrative. I was going to be an accountant and do some other administrative work. And I'm probably giving hint to what this business is a little bit, but um, there was some notice that I might have to be there um, at night alone, in the dead of night, alone, sometimes. So we, um, you know, I, I talked to my mom, I talked to my spouse at the time, and I had gotten another job offer that was not as great, but felt safer. Um, until he showed up to buy kitchen cabinets. So there was that. What other crazy, there was other crazy, uh, oh, what did, you, again, everyone was like, well, why couldn't you protect yourself? I was a baby. I was all of like 25 years old, 20, 20, yeah, I was about 25 years old. 
And I didn't know how to protect my energy. I didn't know how to protect myself even in sleep. I didn't know how to do that. So now I do. And maybe that is why I haven't had interactions with him or any dreams with him. So there was that. But that is my story. And that's a true story. It's a crazy story. I believe in you guys. Take care. You believe in vampires. Yes. Let's talk about vampires because what the f There's been a TikTok. <laughs> Katie and Dana, I'm so happy that you guys are talking about real vampires. I have tea. I'm going to tell you about how I met real vampires and also about a crazy story where I was being fed on. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, I'm a paranormal investigator. I also do a lot of research regarding the paranormal and folklore and cryptids. And about a year ago, I posted a video about my research on real vampires. The video wound up going viral and real vampires wound up watching my video and reaching out to me. Because of this video about real vampires and me meeting real vampires, I also wound up meeting Ben Alan Koosh, the owner of a paranormal production company, New Blood Universe, who I now work with. New Blood Universe has a docu-series coming out about real vampires, so make sure you're following their socials if you're interested. New Blood Universe is also producing a show that me and my best friend Danelle are doing called The Curious Crypt. It's a paranormal investigation show. For the show, in March 2024, Danelle and I packed our bags and headed to New Orleans to do some investigations. While we were there, we wound up going into a vampire bar. Had to get a password to go in there. It was very secretive. Go to New Blood Universe to see the full story on it because we just posted it there. We see this like candelabra and this, this man looked like a fuck, like looked like a vampire. He looked like a straight up vampire. We know we're going to meet with a specific vampire who is considered an elder. I right off the bat did not like him. Like I had a weird feeling about him. And I just didn't care to be honest. I met him. I was like, okay, well I'm going to go get drinks. So I was inside while you had this whole conversation with him where he fed on people yeah. who are right in the street in front of you. Yeah. Yes, they would start to like almost look like disoriented. But basically I wound up meeting a blue haired Colin Robinson. I don't know if you've seen what we do in the shadows, but Colin Robinson is an energy vampire and I met him and he comes in a form of a female who literally sucked the life out of me. In my defense, I was like, this girl has blue hair. She's part of a LARPing group and I'm a nerd. She's probably going to be really cool to talk to. So Danelle and I go to talk to her and let me tell you out of all of the things that we could talk about, she talks about the public policy of her LARPing group. I don't even know how long she talked for, but I felt like every ounce of my life was drained from me. I was so bored I could have slept for 10 years. Not only have I spoken with real vampires in length to get all of the information I could, but I'm also really good friends with a lot of real vampires. I promise you, they're not all bad. Just like humans in general, humans can be good, humans can be bad, we can be morally gray, we can be somewhere in between, and that's pretty much where anything with will and forethought and all of those things land. They can be good, bad, somewhere in between. If you are into the supernatural, folklore, cryptids, the paranormal, and real vampires, and the fae, gotta mention them because I love them, make sure you're following me, make sure you're following New Blood Universe because things are about to get weird. Want to get creeped out? For those of you who don't know, I've been doing research on creepy folklore, creepy creatures, kind of from around the world. While doing this research, I came across real vampires. I read about a man named John Browning who was an American writer and scholar, and he actually researched real vampires for years. Now, no, these are not supernatural beings that can turn into bats and sparkle in the sunlight. I don't know how they feel about garlic. Was I disappointed about this? Not really sure. My favorite vampires are from what we do in the shadows. If you haven't seen it or watched it, you need to it's hilarious. So John had been searching for real vampires for a very long time and he finally found one in a clothing store in the French Quarter of New Orleans. A woman came into the store with two teenage boys and the shop owner let John know that this was the person he was looking for. John decides to strike up a conversation with this lady and let her know that he is studying real vampires. During this conversation she did smile which revealed two teeth filed down to look like fangs. John did give her his number but she never got back to him. Luckily a few 
few weeks later, he met some more real vampires in a nightclub in New Orleans. And a few weeks after that, he met what is called an elder vampire. And this was an older man who was a real living vampire. This gentleman invited John to NOVA meetings and NOVA stands for New Orleans Vampire Association. This is where John started his five year study of real vampires and I'm going to share some of that study with you. According to John's research, symptoms of vampirism start when the person reaches puberty. They call this your awakening or coming out of the coffin, which is hilarious because I'm a lesbian and I came out of the closet and they're coming out of the coffin. I think it's beautiful. Now these are typically people who are feeling drained for no reason. It isn't an iron deficiency. It isn't a B12 deficiency. Something else is going on and that's what finally might lead them to this conclusion. Now, depending on the type of vampire, they might discover that plasma or energy from another source is what gives them energy. The ones that need plasma are called sanguinarians and they might discover this for instance by accidentally biting their lip and realizing that from that plasma they are getting a burst of energy. These are people who really do feel like they need plasma to live. Although there are different covens of vampires and a lot of them feel that it's taboo to drink plasma and that is for reasons I'll get into in the next video. But then we have our energy vampires and they feed on psychic energy from other humans. Again, if anyone's ever seen what we do in the shadows, Colin Robinson is an energy vampire and he's so funny. But I've learned through my research that energy vampires aren't really actually these Colin Robinsons who just drain you of all of your energy just from talking to you because they're so boring. They actually might do this from an actual massage. Follow for part two. Want to get creeped out? Let's keep talking about real vampires. I was just talking about how there are two different types of vampires. The first ones are called sanguinarians, and these are ones that need plasma due to a medical condition. The other ones are called energy vampires, and they feed off of psychic energy. They are not like Colin Robinson from what we do in the shadows, unfortunately, but also not unfortunately. But they will get this psychic energy from something like a massage. Now, like vampires in pop culture, they do talk about drinking plasma as feeding. And they do describe taking psychic energy as feeding as well. The people who they get this energy or plasma from are considered their donors. There are different covens of vampires throughout the world, and depending what coven you belong to, drinking plasma might actually be taboo. The reason for this is because there can be some very serious medical repercussions from sharing plasma. So don't try this at home, okay? There's also something called elder vampires, and these are vampires who have been experiencing vampirism for a long time, and are looked to for wisdom. In my previous video, I did mention a man named John Browning who studied real vampires for about five years. He claimed that the vampires he studied could not control their urges. Some would even feed as often as three to five times a week. If they were offered a large amount of plasma, they would store some in the fridge and then mix it into something later like some tea. I think I'm going to stick with my Earl Grey. However, for many people that experience vampirism, it isn't just a lifestyle choice. It is something that is inherently a part of them. There doesn't seem to be a medical explanation for this condition, and many state that if it, there was an explanation and they could just take a pill for it to go away, they would. However, a lot of people who experience vampirism do not share this with their doctors due to the stigma attached. Just because there isn't a medical explanation doesn't mean that there won't be one that's eventually found. We are discovering new things every day and what seems like magic in one day and age in another day and age is just science. That being said, a lot of the current and modern day living vampires are very akin to your modern day witch. It's a lot about spirituality. It's a lot about energy. There was also a sociologist from Idaho State University who studied real vampires as well. He stated that there were no psychiatric issues with the vampires that he studied. Through John Browning's study, he did discover that many play the part of wearing the prosthetic fangs, dressing gothically, and just kind of looking how you would expect a vampire to look. But a lot of these people dress normally, have normal jobs, normal families, and hide their vampirism from even their children. He thought that during his research, he would discover that these were all super fans of Twilight or True Blood, but that just wasn't the case. This is truly a group of misunderstood people who normally stick to themselves due to the stigma. Let me know if you want to hear any of the stories some of these people had about what would happen if they didn't feed. And sorry to the girlies who are disappointed that these aren't your vampires from Twilight. I got to admit though, I'm not a big Twilight. I like girly. The lion fell in love with the lamb quote makes me want to barf. See you next time.
This is what you need to know about real vampires, and this is also about the studies that were done on what happened to real vampires when they didn't feed. The first thing you need to know about real vampires is that number one, the sanguinarians, and these are the ones that need plasma due to a medical condition. They're not just going to random people in the street and being like, hey, can I suck your blood? No, that's not happening. These real vampires, these sanguinarians, they will have donors who are consenting to this. And they don't bite them, they do it a different way. Donors are typically someone that they've known for a long time, that they trust, there's a mutual trust there. And the same thing goes for energy vampires. They're not just going and sifting energy off anyone they meet. At least from the vampires that I've got to speak to, this is a consensual thing and consent is very important to them. They will have someone that consents to giving their energy to the real living vampire. And this is usually done through a massage. Number two, I know a lot of the people who watched my first video about real vampires know what the medical condition is that they have. A lot of people said this one, which I don't even know how to say that. The thing is these real living vampires have been searching for answers for years. Many of them have gone to many doctors and their doctors have not found an explanation. Maybe this one that I can't say is the case for some, but it's not the case for all. Number three, a sociologist from Idaho State University who also studied real vampires stated that there was nothing psychologically wrong. Identifying as a real vampire isn't just a mental illness. People used to say that being gay is a mental illness. Let me tell you, if it is a mental illness, it rocks. Because I have mental illnesses, I have depression, I have anxiety, but being gay, best part of my life. So right now there is no medical explanation about real vampirism, but that doesn't mean that one won't eventually be found. Number four, being a real living vampire isn't just about feeding off of energy or plasma. It's very similar or akin to your modern day witch that practices Wicca, for instance, people who use crystals, people who believe in energy. So if you believe in things like that, this isn't that far off. My opinion, as long as you're not hurting anybody, as long as everything is consensual, I don't really care how you live your life. I think people should do what makes them happy and what feels authentic to them. There are always going to be things that we don't understand because they just don't make sense for us. But just because they don't make sense for us doesn't mean that they don't make sense for other people. And I think it's better to live life accepting that and embracing people for who they are. Stop being the judgmental life police who wants to control how everyone else lives when it's really none of your business. Embrace people for who they are, let them live a happier life, let yourself live a happier life. Now in the first video, I talked about an American writer and scholar named John Browning, and he had studied real living vampires for years. He gave an example of one woman who had gone four months without feeding, and she wound up in the hospital. She had a very low heart rate, and when she would stand up, her heart rate would shoot up extremely high. She would experience intense migraines and loss of consciousness would often follow. There was another woman who couldn't even walk when she didn't feed, and she also wound up in the emergency room after not feeding for a period of time. Her husband came to visit her in the hospital. She ended up feeding from him and felt right as rain. John stated that he believed the people that he interviewed and studied and that they were reliant on plasma. I think it's good to have a healthy amount of skepticism, but I also think it's awesome to just embrace people for who they are and let people be themselves. And the biggest reason that I don't just automatically diss things that are supernatural or different or that there's no medical explanation for is because new things are being found constantly and what is magic one day is science the next. Very soon I will be posting about the conversations that I've had with real vampires and let me know what you guys think. See you next time.